Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Africa uh, up to about 1500. So again, this is US 1. And before we can get to the colonization of the New World and the creation of the US, you know, again, there are three main players to this story. Really four, if we add the natural world, which was the first thing we talked about. And then we talked about pre-Columbian peoples. Then we, you know, now we're going to talk about Africans. And then the second part of this lecture uh, will be Europeans. And of course, the history of, of North America, in particular, in particular, the U.S., it's really the bringing together of these three main groups of people, Native Americans, Africans, and Europeans. So again, to really understand our history as Americans, we have to understand the history of those three people. So we've done pre-Columbian peoples. Today, we're going to talk just a little bit about the history of the continent of Africa. And then we're also going to be dealing uh, next time with a little bit with the history of Europe. And then we're going to finally bring all these players together and they become us. So starting this, uh, as you can see here, is a map of the New World. This is a map from 1544. And of course, it, it's always fun to look at these old maps. And I think people today, it, it, you know, love to look at these and kind of giggle and say, look how terrible they are. What always surprises me, though, is, is how much they actually get right in these old maps, considering, you know, uh, they had no satellite, no GPS, you know, they had nothing to go on. Um, and they actually get a lot of the basic shapes right. I mean, you can very clearly see Florida in there. The, the basic shape of South America is pretty right. One thing also, this has nothing to do with the lecture today, but one thing you might notice if you, if, you know, like there's one word that might really stand out. I mean, you can kind of see the word new world, new visobus, but there's one word that really looks familiar and it's right in the middle towards the top and that's Cuba. Um, what's interesting is most of the names we use today, you know, whether it's Florida or Tallahassee or Bainbridge, I mean, obviously these are not the original names that the original peoples used. Even the names that we use, like say Tallahassee, Florida, um, Okefenokee Swamp, those kinds of names, Suwannee River, those are not the original Native American names. In some cases, they are Native American, but they're not necessarily named by those people who live there. They're usually named by Americans or Europeans. And of course, the, uh, the River Suwannee is not Native American at all. It actually uh, is, a, is a bastardization of uh, a Spanish word, San Juan, as in St. John. And there is a St. John's River, and some map makers sort of got it mixed up and called another river as San Juan, which later became Sewanee, and now everybody thinks it's a Native American name. Anyway, it's just a little weird fact there. Now, th again, this map was 1544. Uh, this map of the continent of Africa was also 1544. And yet, it's much more accurate. It, it, it's, it's very detailed. In fact, if you start really looking at it, you can start to see, it looks like little squiggly lines all along the edges. Each one of those is a port, it's a city. And you can see, again, there, there's sort of symbols that represent kingdoms and stuff. And you start to realize that, again, the knowledge of Africa for, by Europeans, this is a European map, is much, much greater, obviously, than it is the New World. Now, of course, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, obviously, Africa is in the Old World. It's just a little bit south of Europe. And, and you're right, obviously. Northern uh, Africa, like Egypt, for instance, and, and, and Europe had a lot of contact. But most Europeans assumed that Africa, which actually the, the word Africa comes from the Greeks. It was the land of the Afri, which is uh, a, an ancient group. We're not really sure exactly which group that would be today. But for, the, but for Greeks, they were the land of the Afri. And they really thought it was just a really big island. And, and really Europeans had no idea just how far uh, the continent of Africa went. And it wouldn't actually be until the 1440s, and we'll get into this later with slavery, it wasn't until the 1440s that uh, Henry the Navigator from Portugal actually began to sail down the west coast of Africa and realized just how big this continent really was. So again, 1544 was in a way the European discovery of the vastness of Africa, and that's only 50 years, uh, basically, uh, before the discovery by Europeans of the New World. 
And yet you can see that uh, by 1544, the knowledge of Africa was so much greater than the knowledge of the New World. Again, it was a little bit closer, obviously. Uh, but this is something that I think might be surprising to people today is that it's, it clearly was of interest to Europeans. I think there's a, an assumption today by many people that uh, Africa you know, was just kind of in the back of Europeans' minds and maybe a place for slaves, but it's the New World that they wanted. Maybe not so much early on, as, as we'll see. Um, before I go any further, I do need to say this lecture is, is actually should be a lot more in depth than it is. Um, and, and, and again, it's kind of an apology in a weird way. Um, you know, I'm a, I have a PhD in history. I, I went to a two-year school, then I went to a four-year school to get my bachelor's degree in history with a minor in anthropology. I got my master's degree at FSU in history, public history, and then I got my PhD at FSU in American history and world history. And not one of those schools taught one course, not one course on Africa history. There's a couple of world history courses that touched on Africa. They didn't have, it wasn't even an option. After I left FSU in 08 to, to come to, to this college, um, they did hire one historian to cover the entire continent of Africa. Today it's over a billion people live on the continent of Africa. And there was one historian she wasn't even American. She was German. Nothing wrong with that. It's just interesting. She wasn't even American uh, to teach the entire history of the entire continent of Africa. You know, we have, uh, like, I do Scottish history. In addition to American, I do Scottish history. Some people do English history. Uh, I, I have colleagues that study only English literature from the 1600s. And yet, there was one person to teach the entire continent. And it's the cradle of humanity. Um, and she's even gone now. If you went to FSU today, in 2020, she's not even there anymore. They don't have an African historian anymore. And it is interesting, you know, that, that, that for so long, professional historians really didn't pay attention much to Africa. That is beginning to change. Both historians and anthropologists uh, are now beginning to look. But it is, and clearly there is an element of prejudice here. There is, you know, a, a bias here. But it's not just that. That's part of it. There is other challenges, though. Um, even though Africa has not always had tons and tons of problems, I mean, in the 20th century and in the 21st century, there are major problems in parts of Africa. There's disease issues, uh, there's revolution issues, there's instability issues. That's a bit of a problem if you're trying to do research. Um, there's also the problem of archives. Um, some of these societies were not literate societies. They were more traditional societies. So uh, there is a problem of records. Although, as we're going to see, that's not the case with all these societies. Um, there's also the issue of language. There is uh, five, ma five language families spoken on the continent of Africa. You know, it's estimated that many, maybe as many as 1,500 dialects have been spoken on the continent of Africa. So if you're going to do the history of Africa, really, you have to know all the, I mean, it's just impossible for any one person, obviously, to do that. Uh, so there are real challenges. So let's, you know, and it is a huge undertaking. Um, I say that all that, I'll say all that just to say that this is, uh, if you're looking for an in-depth history of Africa, this ain't it. <laughs> but it is an intro level US one history. So uh, I, I, I think uh, we can be forgiven for not going too in-depth. But it is, it is interesting how little most of us actually know. Now, obviously, we're in, you know, online for this. Uh, if we were face-to-face, -face, one of the things I would have everybody do, and in fact, if you want to do this, and I'm sure, and I'm sure you're dying to do this, <laughs> but if you want to do it just, just for yourself, it, it might be an interesting exercise. But what I usually have my students do is I tell everybody to take out a sheet of paper, and I say, give me five words to describe Africa. In other words, when you hear the word Africa, what comes to mind? And so if you want to hit the pause and do it yourself just to see what you come up with, go for it. Uh, but anyway, and I can pretty much predict, in fact, sometimes I'll sit there and I'll write up a bunch of words and I'll guess almost every word that the students are going to say because I've done it long enough that I pretty much guess what they're going to say. Um, and it's always a little different. There's always, you know, but and then, oh, before I give you what they usually say, then, then I say, oh, by the way, now give me five words to describe Europe. When you hear Europe, what do you think? And so they spend a couple of minutes doing that. Then I have them turn them in, and then I read them out, you know, back. And again, it is really interesting because there are very distinct 
differences in the way they describe boats. I mean, obviously they're two different places, but it is interesting. By the way, the one thing everybody wants to say, but most people are scared to say <laughs> with Africa is something like that's where Africans come from, or that's where people who have dark skin or black people come from. It's like everyone's thinking about it. But nobody wants to say it. And obviously it's a legit description. And of course, Europe is where white people come from. Um, but it's interesting if you look at the words that people use for Africa. I mean, you, sometimes you'll get homeland or you'll see cradle of humanity or something like that, especially since in this class we do talk about origins of humans. But most of the time, the vast majority of the words they use are either natural, heat, desert, sand, lions, uh, sometimes they say tigers, although well, there's no tigers in Africa, elephants, safaris, you know, hot, humid, jungle. Uh, they either say something like that. Sometimes they'll say gold or diamonds or oil, you know, natural resources, or something that, that really is relatively negative, disease, poverty, war. I mean, I've already mentioned war, uh, corruption, slavery, death, starving children. I mean, you'll get some other words in there, but most of the time, the, that's kind of in the you know the, the the ballpark. So if anybody actually did it, I'm curious what you guys might have said. And then for Europe, I mean, sometimes you get World War II or you get Holocaust or Black Plague, but most of the time for Europe, you don't get as much natural, even though they're both natural places that also have humans. Um, sometimes I'll get rainy or cold or cloudy. I find that students in Southwest Georgia, when they think of Europe, they pretty much think of the United Kingdom. They're thinking England or Scotland, most students, maybe Paris. Uh, but, but usually what you get is civilization. Oh, by the way, for Africa, sometimes you get primitive, savage, native is a really common one, tribal or tribes, that's a really common one. And by the way, all those words are legit and, and they all fit. Um, but, but for Europe, you usually get words like civilization, castles, royalty, fashion, chocolate, uh, tea, wine, Eiffel Tower, London, cities. And I would argue mostly a little more positive, maybe some wars have thrown in, but you, and definitely much more human, much more cultural. So one's very natural and maybe negative, while the other one is very cultural uh, and usually a little bit more positive. Uh, and by the way, the reason I know it's usually England, uh, other than sometimes they just say England, is they always say, and they drive on the wrong side of the road, which only in Britain do they do that. Actually, the rest of Europe drives just like we do, but anyway. Um, and and, and I, again, it's not the point of, oh, look how prejudiced we all are. It's not, although there's a little bit of that, but it does show, and by the way, I'm the same way. If I'm really honest, if you say Africa to me, I'm thinking lions, Lion King, jungles, I'm the exact same way. But it is a point I make that I think that does affect how we think of history. You know, I mean, it, it is, I think, very easy to just go, well, Africa doesn't really have a history. Europe does. And I think it just kind of perpetuates itself. So by the way, if anybody here is a historian, I know I think I have two history majors, uh, at least this fall of 2020. Although you might be listening to this five years from now, I, I do reuse these, but still, I know I usually have one or two. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. Africa history is not a bad field to get into because hardly anybody does it. It's wide open, literally wide open. You guarantee job. I'm serious about that, but anyway. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Africa and, and get you know, kind of let's stay with this, this image problem I think Africa has. So to me, this is the quintessential image of Africa. It's even got the colors right. You got the black, you got the orange, you got the yellow. I mean, when you think of Africa, those are the colors we tend to think of. Even though Africa is a massive continent and it's very different depending on which part of the continent you're in, uh, but this is it. You got, you, got, you got your megafauna, you got a big lion. I mean, literally a lion king, you got your hot sun. It looks wide open, a few trees, looks like it could be a savanna. I mean, again, this is classic Africa image. And if you Google Africa, you'll usually get some kind of image like this. I, again, it's, most of the images are very tribal, excuse me, very primitive, a, a, a very, a, a very little structures you see. Um, if you've ever been to Disney World, uh, which I know a lot of people up in Southwest Georgia have not. I grew up in Florida. I live in Florida. I think it's a rule if you live in Florida, you have to go every couple of years. But you know, Disney World has 
you know, more than one part. There's Magic Kingdom, and there's Epcot, and there's the Hollywood Place, and then there's the Animal Kingdom. So most of the world is represented at some point, you know, so if you're in the Magic Kingdom, you clearly got a lot of what's clearly Europe, and you got, you know, South America with the Jungle Cruise, and you got the West, and then if you go to Epcot, you could go around the world. You have China, and Mexico, and France, and England, and, and Canada. Even the United States is at, is at Epcot, but not really anything about Africa, and, you know, of course, nothing in Hollywood about Africa. Where do you find Africa at Disney World? Oh, the Animal Kingdom. That's right. It's only where the animals are. And in fact, if you ever go to the Animal Kingdom, it's just a really expensive zoo. Don't bother. But still, if you actually go to Animal Kingdom, um, you'll see a, instead of a big castle in the middle of it, it's a big, giant African tree and a tree very similar to this one, the, the Tree of Life. It is pretty cool, but it is funny that, you know, you don't have uh, Disney movies about Africa uh, legends and stuff. And again, I mean, you could go to parts of Africa today and you'll still see a lot of very traditional peoples living in huts and with grass thatched roofs. Uh, again, I think when people say words like tribal or native or indigenous, it's, it's, it's kind of what we're thinking. And again, they're legit words. There's nothing wrong with those words. Of course not. Um, it is funny though, the word tribe or tribal, um, you know, it really just means groups of people. We're all tribes. We're the American tribe. I'm part of the Florida tribe. You're part of the Georgia tribe. We're, we're, we're part of the college tribe right now. We're in the American tribe, but we don't use those words. In fact, I find that we really only use the word tribe for two groups of people, people in Africa and Native Americans. If, if, you're, if you're from Africa, maybe not African-American, but, but, but an immigrant, like my boss at ABAC, uh, Dr. Joe Jirogi, who's from Kenya, he's asked us all the time, which tribe are you part of? Uh, if you're Native American, people are always asking me that. The only group that I think comes close to that is Scottish people. Uh, people in Scotland, people are always going, which clan are you? What, are you the McDonald clan? And it's really funny because people in Scotland are like, oh, <laughs> only Americans care what clan you're in. Anyway, um, but, but again, I think for most people, tribal, and even when I say it, usually I do think of kind of traditional uh, primitive and such. Now, I remember as a kid, uh, this is a lot older than me, this is a photo from the 30s, but I can remember as a kid, um, pre-internet, National Geographic was a pretty important magazine to us um, because, not to get too specific, but uh, in the days before internet and, and even VCRs, uh, it was educational. You, were, you could read it in the library. You, we subscribed to it at my house. My parents loved me to read it. But the great thing about National Geographic, for a young kid, it was the one place to see naked people. <laughs> and I'm, I'm being quite serious. And, 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 but, but it was tribal people, people from Brazil or some South Pacific island or some remote part of Africa. Like this image. I guarantee YouTube will not flag this for this image, even though there are naked people in it. So all these people, people are like, oh, they're just, they're just tribal. It doesn't matter that they're naked. But if the woman in the center there was naked, that would be a playboy now. That, now I would get in trouble for reading it. And it you know, but of course, as a 10-year-old you know, kid, I didn't care where they came from. They were naked. But, but my point with that, other than being really creepy for a second, is uh, it is interesting how we do kind of make these calls. Even today, you can flip on the channels and you, know, you go to the Discovery Channel and suddenly see a bunch of naked people if they're tribal. And it's almost like you're like, well, they don't count. They're not really civilized like us. So it doesn't really matter. Um, and of course, an image like this, which was very typical of things like National Geographic, which was really kind of playing up the civilized person versus the primitive peoples, the civilized white European versus everybody else, right? Uh, and these images were very common throughout the 20th century, kind of re-emphasizing, you know, this otherness, if you will, of Africa. And again, you can go today, this is another National Geographic image from, I think, the late 90s. And yes, you can go to Africa today and you can find plenty of people who are very traditional and playing you know, like these kids playing the drums and, and, and doing, you know, quote unquote, tribal uh, dances and ceremonies. But what's interesting about magazines such as National Geographic, which are some really interesting studies of that magazine, um, they tend to only focus on these types of images. In other words, um, yeah, a lot of people uh, say in Africa, might for a wedding or uh, a religious ceremony, might dress in a very traditional way, but the rest of the days of the week, they might be wearing ball caps, ball jeans, uh, you know, uh, uh, blue jeans and, you know, with a smartphone. 
Um, so sometimes I think, you know, we, we tend to only get one type of image of Africa as opposed to a, a much more full, fuller image of Africa. And, you know, again, this is a classic uh, example, I think, of the otherness. In other words, what makes Africa so different from the rest of us? Uh, this is, a, again, very typical. In fact, the putting literally the plates or saucers and, and lips and ears, I mean, that used to be a derogatory term for people from Africa, right? Uh, it's funny, there's actually six groups of people in the world that do this, this, this extreme body modification, uh, where, you, again, these large discs are placed, in this case, the ear and in the lips. Uh, all, out of the six groups that do this, only two actually live in Africa. Uh, this is the most famous of the group. Uh, it is the Sarah group. Uh, they live today in modern day Chad. They're a relatively small group today. Only the elites do this. Uh, it's, it's, it's not even most of them. Now you ask me why, I don't have a logical reason. Of course, there's lots of things that we do that we don't have logical reasons for. Uh, usually if I'm in the classroom, I'll kind of look around and, and ask people, why do you have a hole in your ear. You know, if you think about it, we people will get their ear, they stick a hole in it that they weren't born with, and they place a piece of metal in their ear or in their nose or in their lips or other parts of their bodies. And you think, well, why did you do that? Some people have doodled all over their body permanently. It doesn't go away. In other words, a tattoo. Why do you do that? You just thought it just looks cool. It's what everybody else is doing. You know, why why do you have paint on your face? Oh, that's makeup. Well, why do you have that? You know what I mean? In other words, we all do things, all cultures do things that from an outsider looks weird and odd, but from the inside makes total sense. Now, admittedly, this is a bit extreme. There's no getting around that. And it is a sign of eliteness. And by the way, this person goes even further because um, as you can see on their arm, they have these implants. So it's even further body modification. And yeah, you can, there is an otherness here. I know most students when they see this, they go, oh my God, how does she eat? What is going on there? Um, and you're absolutely right, there is an otherness, but that's the, I think sometimes from a historian's viewpoint, that can be a problem if that's all you see is the otherness. In other words, I think a National Geographic photographer could come to Southwest Georgia and go to certain places and meet certain people and find a lot of otherness, a lot of strangeness, if you will, about us. You know, I mean, there's plenty, I've had plenty of students over the years that have done various forms of body modification. Uh, maybe not quite as extreme as this person, but I've had plenty of students with gauges in their ears and, 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 and lots of tattoos and things like that. And that's not necessarily representative of all people in Southwest Georgia right? Or, you know, people in a certain, doing a certain activity, so they may be dressed a certain way, so they look kind of strange, but they may not look like it all the time. All I'm just saying is sometimes once you understand a group of people, they may not seem quite as strange as they do on the surface. Um, anyway, some other images I think we've had of Africa throughout the 20th century. Again, these are pretty old, the, the early versions of Tarzan the Ape Man uh, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. But even when I was a kid, I mean, you still could see Tarzan movies. In fact, I think they made one just a few years ago. My advice to filmmakers, don't make Tarzan. It, it's, <laughs> the time is gone. It's never going to work. And it is interesting. I mean, the, the story is about uh, these English explorers and, and they leave behind, uh, by accidentally leave behind a baby. And of course, that baby grows up to be Tarzan, king of the jungle. Those Africans that have been there for thousands and thousands of years, not. Nah, it's Tarzan that's king of the jungle. Uh, why? Because he's a white European, right? So again, it is interesting. Maybe not you and I as much, but, but our ancestors are, you know, people who came before us, this is you know, very typical images that they were fed. One of my favorite movies growing up, and I'll be honest, it's still one of my favorite movies, the old 1933 King Kong, um, which is, you know, for anybody who's seen the movie, the first thing you're screaming is, it's not Africa. Why are you, keep, why are you talking about King Kong? And you're absolutely right. King Kong, even the remakes are still the same. Uh, explorers go to some strange Pacific island, and they find dinosaurs, and then they take back King Kong, which always blows me away if you've ever seen any of the King Kong movies, whether it's the 33 or 76 or 84, or uh, they make, just made one recently. Um, it, it's like there's dinosaurs everywhere. And what do they do? They get, the, they, they get the freaking ape. I'm like, get the dinosaurs. That's the cool part. Who cares about that stupid ape? Get the, the dinosaurs are amazing. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm a geek. So, um, But even though it's supposed to be South Pacific Island, the original movie, um, it, it's clearly 
Africa, right? I mean, that it's, it's coded as Africa. And of course they have African-Americans playing uh, the natives and they're, you know, and again, it's a classic image of natives, you know, literally carrying spears and going ooga booga. Uh, by the way, the chief here that's on the right uh, of the image, that's a, a guy named Noble Johnson. He was a major actor in, in, in black cinema in the 20s and 30s. But he, of course, there was no money in black cinema. He wanted to go to Hollywood. So, but when he went to Hollywood, he had to play roles like this. I mean, this is, if you're a black actor, this is, you're playing a slave or you're playing uh, a primitive native. So. But what you don't see is obviously images of cities. And, and yes, a lot of Africa is, is very undeveloped. It's very, it can be very tribal, but we also have cities in Africa. Um, I had to cheat a little bit here just to remind myself of some of these cities. This is uh, Namibia. Uh, this is Namibia. The previous image is the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, we have uh, uh, Nigeria. Uh, this is a city, Lagos, that's 18 million people. This is Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, this is a city in Liberia. Uh, and uh, there's a, you know, plenty of universities throughout Africa, not as much as we do, and they're definitely not at the same rank of American universities. I mean, that's why so many exchange students come to the US. But again, we don't tend to think of universities. Sometimes students will write Oxford or Cambridge when they're thinking of Europe. I've never had a student say a university. Again, even though the head of the history department at ABAC and my boss, Dr. Joe Jirogi, got his PhD, in Kenya, he's you know he's a Kenya scholar who now teaches in the U.S. Um, and again, we tend not to think of and this. By the way, this one is in Zimbabwe, um, and there's a, there's a lot of universities nowhere near what we have. But but this is just a quick uh, a, just a, a, a quick find on Google map of some of the universities that are there. Um, you know, and again, many people in Africa are doing exactly what you're doing. They're going to college, they're getting a degree, hoping to get a good job. Maybe they'll go get some cable, get internet, watch some movies. Like you guys get HBO or Netflix or something. And I I just mentioned uh, you know. Uh, maybe getting the internet. And even though, again, uh, the development, and, and I want to be careful here because I know some of you are going, come on, you trying to say Africa is just like the United States? Of course not. Uh, but we are beginning to see a lot of development in Africa, including internet access. It is changing. Uh, again, it, early 2000s, very little penetration of the internet in Africa. But then again, there is very little internet in Southwest Georgia. I still occasionally have students that don't have good internet. Um, but that has drastically changed. This is uh, an article from just a year ago. Over half a billion Africans have access to internet. It may not always be a smartphone. It may be at an internet cafe instead of in their homes. But again, Africans are online today and it's growing and growing and growing. Again, we're talking over a third of Africans today in 2020 are getting online on a daily basis. And again, you can start looking at some of these numbers. I mean, look at the population. People forget how many people there are on the continent. And by the way, I keep saying that because I think people tend to think of Africa as like one big country. It is a lot of countries. Um, but uh, in fact, it's, it's, I usually ask students, like how many countries are in Africa? And then the typical answer I get is about 25. There's actually 55 nations on the continent of Africa today. In a moment, I'll show you a map with all of them. Um, but again, you can look some of the, 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 the popular, Algeria, 43 million people, 25 million of them are online. Uh, Cameroon, 26 million people, over 6 million are online on a regular basis. This is a few years ago, but this was a, just a map of where the tweets are coming out of Africa. And you can see parts of it. There's nothing like where the Congo is or where the Sahara Desert is, nothing. But then you look at South Africa and, and Namibia and, and Northern where Africa, excuse me, Egypt is and, and Tanzania on the right and lots and lots of tweets. And this is, that, and that's an old image. A few years back, um, there was a Twitter campaign uh, on in several African countries because you know, Africans aren't fools. They, they get that they have an image problem, that they know that when the rest of the world thinks of Africa, they're thinking slavery, poverty, uh, diseases, wars, lions. And so if you're, you know, to make money, they need businesses to invest on, you know, in the continent of Africa. So they need to change their image. So there was a campaign a few years ago uh, asking people to tweet images of themselves, you know, Africans to do this, uh, to show that there is a, you know, 
differences. I mean, you know, look, you got a hipster in Africa. You got people going to shopping malls, buying fashionable clothing. And not everybody looks the same in Africa. You know, you go to Northern Africa or places like South Africa and you have people, some people of European heritage that have lived there for over a hundred years. Sharif Theron, for instance, a famous actress, she's South African, for instance. Um, and you have people who may be more what, what Americans would call more Middle Eastern living in Africa. So again, there is a lot more variety, I think, than people realize. And, um, and, and which is my main point. Having said that, uh, let's not get out of hand. Um, there is a reason why we talk about the developed world versus the developing world. Um, in the old days, we would say the first world and the third world. We, we, we don't really say that anymore, um, partly because that's an old Cold War term. Uh, it, it, before the early 90s, during the Cold War, uh, the first world, or you might say the first and second world, was the communist world, Russia, China, and the democracies, uh, United States, Canada, England, France, Japan, right? So these two worlds were battling it out in the third world which would have been Africa, would have been Latin America, would have been parts of Asia, like Korea or Vietnam, right? And so that's why they use the term third world. These are places that used to be colonies. Now they're free and they're trying to decide whether to be democracies or be communism. But now that the Cold War is over, uh, although I think we're in a new Cold War, but nonetheless, that Cold War is over, um, again, third world doesn't work anymore. So now we call them developing nations. It just means they're developing. And they're still in the process of developing. Remember, many of these countries in Africa have only recently been freed from colonialism. And maybe 70 years, some cases, 1960s before they were finally done with colonialism. So they're where we were in the 1800s, if you will. And so this is a map of the world showing internet activity. And I, I, in my world history class, I, I have a very similar map that shows basically electricity. And it's almost identical. Uh, you look at Europe, you look at the United States, like look at Florida, uh, you can see India, uh, Japan, parts of China, very, Southern Korea, very lit up. Brazil, pretty lit up. Uh, and then you look at uh, parts of Latin America, uh, don't pay attention to Canada because Canada is half of that's ice. But then you look at parts of Asia, pretty, pretty quiet. And then you look at Africa. And yeah, other than a little bit in South Africa, it's pretty quiet. Today, 2020, it would be a little bit more. But, but even though I am trying to change your image a little bit of Africa, again, let's not pretend that they are like us as far as development. They got a long way to go still. Uh, but but they've, they're a lot further than I think people realize. And just a, real quick, this is a modern day uh, map of Africa today. Uh, there's one country missing. If you look right almost center top, you see uh, the word Sudan. And uh, that country today is actually two countries. This is a slightly older map about four years ago. Sudan had a massive civil war, which resulted in the creation of Southern Sudan that kind of broke away from the rest of Sudan. So that was the 55th country. And that's still to this day, the newest country in the world is South Sudan. Uh, but other than that, this is the country of Africa. Every single time I look at it, I see a country that you know, that I, I didn't remember. I mean, you know, you really do forget how many countries are in Africa today. All right, so let's get a little bit back to history. Um, as I said, I'm kind of, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of stretching this out a little bit, but I do think that's important uh, because I do think the images of a place does affect the history, uh, how we look at the history of a place. So Africa does have a different history than say Europe or uh, the United States, and, and there are some reasons for this. Now, if you're in my online class, we haven't really done a lot with the environment, although my face-to-face -face class, we do a whole section on the environment. So I know in this class, if you're online, uh, we haven't really talked much about the environment. Uh, but one of the things I always argue is that the environment plays a huge role in the history of humans. And I'm, I mean, I'm partly an environmental historian. A lot of what I do deals with that. And you can learn a lot about the history of a place by looking at the environment. Um, so, for instance, if you look at the continent of Africa, you see here, it's kind of like an upside down L, right? So the top part runs this way, but most of it runs north to south. So if we were in class, I would ask you, why does that matter? And in fact, if you look at the world, um, you can see that, uh, you know, the, the northern hemisphere is much more like this. You know, if you think of the United States, it, it's really not that you know, the difference between, say, Florida 
in Maine really isn't that far. You know, we, we talk about, oh, it's way up north, but really, it, it's, it's not that very, I mean, it's just a little over a thousand miles. And across, it's about 3,000 miles. So we're definitely three to one as far as, you know, north to south versus east to west. Canada's the same way. Um, Europe is more like that. And much of Asia, like China and parts of Russia, and even Australia tends to run that way. And then some places like Central and South America run north and south. Much of Africa runs that way, but also parts of Southeast Asia, like Indonesia and India and, say, Korea or Vietnam tend to run that way. Uh, why does that matter? And, and so let me go back to looking at Africa again. So why that matters is it, it can affect movements of people. So even though there's a big difference between, say, you know, Tallahassee, Florida versus New York City as far as the environment, it's not massively different. There are some crops we can grow in the south that you can't grow up north and vice versa, but it's really not that different. The types of food that you can grow, the types of animals you can keep, the types of farming you do, you're, you're, not, you're, you're kind of in the same temperate zones. Uh, and we also tend to be quite a bit north of the equator. The southern hemisphere is much more on the equator, and that makes a little bit of a difference. It's a lot hotter, number one. Uh, but when you run more north and south, like Africa, that's going to limit the movements of people because when you're talking several thousand miles, in fact, let me jump ahead. Oops, going the wrong way. Let me jump ahead to this image. This shows you, I mean, people really do forget how big the continent of Africa is. Most of our world maps, uh, this one's actually a, a, a bit more accurate, uh, but even this one isn't really to scale. Most of the maps that you see of the world are not to scale, partly because you got a round earth on a flat surface. That's a bit of a problem. But most world maps, this one isn't too bad, but most world maps, the northern hemisphere is almost magnified. The most common world map is the Mercator map. That's most of the ones you see out there is the Mercator map. And, and that was on purpose. They made the northern hemisphere bigger because they figure, well, that's all anybody cares about. Nobody cares about the stuff down below. And so Greenland is often portrayed as almost like the size of half of Africa, right? Uh, but when you really look at the actual size, the continent of Africa is massive. Look at all the places you can fit onto the continent of Africa. You can put the entire continental United States just in Western Africa. You can put China in there. You can put India in there. You can put Europe in there. Um, so you really do forget just how big it is. So most of the rest of the lecture today is really going to be about Western Africa, which is, in this map is where United States is. So Western Africa, which is again, only a part of the continent, that's the entire continental United States. So again, when we're talking about movements of people, we're talking major differences in temperate zones and the crops grown and animals that you can raise and stuff. Uh, that's in addition to all the major natural boundaries like mountains and jungles and lakes and rivers like the Congo, um, because we're talking vast differences. And plus, before the modern era, you're just talking about a long way between, uh, you know, thousands of miles between groups of people. Let me back up to the world map again. So again, before, let's, let's go back to, say, 1500, before the creation of, of the New World by Europeans, right? So Native Americans, they're, all, they're completely by themselves. So they're, they're having no interaction with the rest of the world. So they're doing amazing things, but they're limited to themselves. But you look at, say, Northern Africa and, and Southern Europe, that Mediterranean area. That is an incredible place. I mean, that's where the Roman Empire was, the Greek Empire. That's where the Egyptian Empire was. There's a reason why that area was a hotbed of activity. Because you have people from Europe, you have people from Northern Africa, people from the Middle East, which is basically Asia. There's a lot of trade between, you know, the Silk Road. There's trade between Japan and China and India and England and France and Germany over here and Northern Africa here. And they're not just exchanging stuff. They're also exchanging ideas, they're exchanging religions. But you get further down into Africa, because you remember, you got this huge Sahara Desert, and that sort of L part of Africa, that's a desert, that's a barrier. And below that are all these other peoples, but, but they're out of the loop. They're not getting access to all these incredible ideas and all these incredible religions and all these inventions and stuff. So they're, again, they're, they're doing cool stuff, but 
that's all they're doing. You know, they're not exchanging. And when you want to look at the development of science, the development of culture, development of politics, it, it's just like genetics. You know, you don't want to marry your cousin all the time, right? or any time, right? Because it's just this, you become inbred. A culture become inbred. You need constant infusion. We don't have this problem today because we're all over the place. And, and of course, that's the internet. I've seen, since I've been teaching at Bainbridge campus, uh, since 08, I have seen such a change in students just as the internet becomes more prevalent in students, their, their exposure to music, to movies, to television shows, all kinds of stuff. They're so different in 2020 than they were just 12 years ago when I began at Bainbridge because the internet has completely, and streaming and Netflix has completely changed their experience. Um, so this is another reason why uh, things like north-south access, but also natural barriers can affect the history of a people. Okay, so partly what I'm getting at, the reason we historians look at the environment, it, it doesn't determine everything, obviously, but it does provide options and limitations. And a lot of it really is luck of the draw. You know, it's very easy to get very cocky about a culture and say, oh, yes, we're the United States. We're great because we're the United States. And I think we're great, too. Uh, I am an American historian, but we're also really lucky. We happen to have a lot of gold. We have a lot of silver. We have a lot of uh, we have diamonds. We have oil. Uh, we have the best farmland in the world when you talk about the, the, the Great Plains. And in my face to face class, we get a little bit into the creation of all that. Uh, we have pretty decent weather. I know uh, I'm recording this in, uh, I think, uh, August 24th of 2020, and there's a couple of hurricanes that are about to hit Louisiana, so we get that occasionally. Out west, they get a few earthquakes. Obviously, we get some forest fires, but we don't really get, like, we don't get tsunamis. We don't usually get massive volcanoes here. Uh, we're in COVID right now, but generally speaking, we don't get lots and lots of massive tropical diseases here in the way that we see in the rest of the world, and yet we have all these incredible um, all these incredible goodies. So yeah, it would be shocking if the United States was not as major successful country. Um, other parts of the world have not always been as lucky. The example I always use, a uh, country that I used to go to with the college, with a little country of Belize, which is just south of Mexico. Wonderful little country, wonderful people, really hardworking people, uh, but they have no gold, no silver, no oil. Very, they're very tiny, so very little farmland. Yeah, they're a poor country. And it's not because they're lazy or because they're not smart. It's just they don't have a lot of resources. Uh, the, I, now they're making a lot of money through tourism. But uh, before tourism, they were really poor. So again, now we're looking at Western Africa. Uh, just a quick reminder that where the United States is in this map. That's where we're talking about. So that part of Africa, uh, before we get the influx of, of new peoples, um, really there weren't very many animals that could be domesticated. What, in other words, an animal that you can actually keep as a pet or as livestock. Um, for instance, Native Americans, I don't think I say this in the previous lecture. Uh, I always ask students, you know, can you name a, uh, an animal that was domesticated by Native Americans? Sometimes people say dog or cat, and, and, and uh, although most of the cats we are familiar with today actually come from Asia. But uh, yeah, they had dogs, but uh, a few uh, around. But generally speaking, there's only one major animal that Native Americans domesticated. It wasn't even in North or Central America. It was in South America. And of course, it was the llama and its close relative, the alpaca, uh, the Incas, uh, and a couple other groups domesticated them. That's it. And think about the importance of livestock. Not only is it guaranteed meat source, but you also get milk, which from that you can also get cheese and yogurt and things like that. Uh, it's also a source of leather, a source of fur. You don't have to go out and hunt these things. They're right there. Uh, but in a lot of cases like oxen or horses, um, you're talking about labor. I mean, even today you go buy a truck. How do we measure horsepower? We still think of it. Um, so again, if you don't have some of these livestock like horses, or cows, uh, you're going to be in trouble. So uh, in one of the few animals in Western Africa initially that you could domesticate, the guinea fowl. So this is a guinea fowl. It's a chicken. So it's good to eat and fry it up, get some eggs from it. Uh, you're not going to build a castle with a chicken. Uh, same with plants. I mean, they, they obviously have farming. In fact, their farming goes back a lot further than it does for Native Americans in Europe. Uh, but uh, you have yams, you have rice, you have millet. And if you don't know what millet is, it's a, it's a type of grain. There's actually a lot of varieties of it. They would make it up often into kind of a gruel, very similar to grits. In fact, grits, which of course come from corn, uh, grits are 
you know, we kind of think of that as a Southern thing. And it's really an African-American thing because basically they took corn and did the same thing they did with millet and, and basically made this kind of gruel with it. So it's good, it's good nutrients, but it's not wheat or barley. It's not hops. It's not, you know, uh, and then the rice is not quite the same rice that you're going to be getting from uh, Asia. Uh, you know, there's no potatoes or anything like that. It's incredibly nutritional. So it's good, but it's limited. Eventually, they do get cattle and camels into Western Africa. Remember, you got this big desert, and those are going to be brought in by Eurasians. And really, that's just a fancy word of saying Middle Eastern people, primarily people of the Arab uh, ethnicities. And which means that they already have cattle and camels. In a way, they're kind of ahead of the game, and they're the ones bringing it in. So that's a limiting factor right there. And keep in mind, even just for Western Africa, even though it's a massive area, you know, it's the size of us, uh, but there's still a lot of areas. You got desert up north. You do have a jungle on the, uh, excuse me, on the east. You also have a mountain range on the east. So you also have areas that are not inhabitable. So that can be a barrier. So people in Western Africa, even though they're doing pretty cool stuff and they're trading with each other for thousands of miles, they're kind of locked in. They're not able to really communicate with other peoples in other parts of the continent. You know, again, you're getting that kind of culturally speaking, that inbred quality uh, element. Okay. So again, I, I really should have had this map up, but there's a lot of environmental factors affecting peoples in Africa because you do have a lot of these barriers. So Western Africa, again, is kind of locked in from the rest of Africa. So again, another question I often ask, and this usually ends up being a question on uh, the exam as a short answer question, why, why are we the United States of America, the USA? Why aren't we the United States of Africa? And people roll their eyes, oh, that's dumb. But it's not a dumb question at all, in fact. Um, you know, in other words, why was Thomas Jefferson and George Washington from Virginia and not from Tanzania or Nigeria? And that may seem wacky. And students, you know, use it like, well, they didn't want it. They, they didn't want to be there. There's nothing there. There's nothing they wanted. After Europeans, once they realized how big Africa was and once they arrived in Western Africa, they desperately wanted Africa. That they, they had lots of stuff, not just, and this is pre, even pre-slavery, because that's we tend to always go right to slavery. Um, there was incredible, incredible uh, deposits of gold. I mean, still, even today, if you get a dime today, a very good chance it's coming from the continent of Africa. Same with gold. Uh, nowadays, we actually know there's uh, some pretty incredible uh, oil deposits there as well, but even back then, there was stuff there that they didn't have. And, and then I'll talk about just how much gold was in Western Africa. It was unbelievable the amount of gold they had. Um, so there was lots of stuff people wanted there. I mean, there were major cities in Western Africa, major port cities, which again, I see a lot of students sometimes over the years go, no, there wasn't. No, you're just, that's politically correct. No, actually there really wasn't. You're going to see that in a moment. Um, so they wanted it and they, they were colonizing it. They couldn't. They just can't hang on to it. In fact, the, the quote I have here is the white man's grave, as some people called it at the time. In other words, it was within reach. I mean, Africa is, to go back to the world map, Africa is right there. Just, I mean, in fact, Spain is almost touching Africa. I've been to Spain. And when you go to southern Spain, you can literally, just barely, you can see the mountains of northern Africa. It was within reach, um, but it, they couldn't grab it. They couldn't hang on to it. Sorry, I need to go back to where I was. It was within reach, but they couldn't grab it. Why? There's two main reasons. So this is your answer to this question. There are two main reasons for this. First off, and we're about to get into them in a moment, there were some major West African empires that fought off the Europeans. So that's, I know everybody's going, what about slavery? I thought Europeans enslaved Africans and brought them to the New World. And they absolutely did. Uh, we're not getting into slavery today. That's a later lecture. But uh, what you do not see are Europeans like uh, Portuguese or Spanish or English marching into the jungles of Africa. Which, by the way, nobody lived in the jungle. It's a jungle. Uh, they lived in cities and towns. But nonetheless, they never marched into the jungle and captured Africans. You see that in movies all the time. 
it's not happening. First off, uh, they didn't know where they were going. Uh, and not only that, but the people there wouldn't let them. They traded for these slaves. And we'll get into that later because there was already a, a pre-existing slave system already in Western Africa that the Europeans just sort of took advantage of and then expanded themselves. Anyway, that's an issue for later. So West African empires is number one. And number two, and this is really the main reason, disease. The Europeans were constantly going to Western Africa and dying. Uh, the average, it was about 90%. Within a year, 90% of your average European colony would be dead. They're going to have a hard time coming to the new world, but nothing like this. And in fact, we don't really see major colonization of anywhere in, in Africa really until the late 1800s. This is why so many countries in Africa today are just now, in the last 50 years, becoming independent. Because from the 1880s, really through the 1950s and 1960s, Europeans colonized Africa. Why so late? Because of vaccinations. You had to discover germs first. And then once you discover germs, then you can develop vaccinations to, to prevent getting diseases. And it was only with the vaccinations that Europeans were able to really begin to conquer in Africa. And by that point, these West African empires had already been decimated uh, from lots of reasons, including slavery. But uh, so at the time Europeans wanted it, they just couldn't get it. Now I know you're thinking, well, doesn't, didn't Native Americans fight back? And you're absolutely right, they did. The big difference in that case is it was flipped. Instead of Europeans and Africans getting the diseases, instead, it was the Native Americans getting diseases. And real quick, I just realized I hadn't talked about it yet. Why were diseases so bad in Western Africa? Um, a couple of things are going on here. Partly, you know, again, humans originated in Africa, but some humans left Africa. They went to Europe, they went to Asia. Eventually, some came to North America. So if you think about the history of the world, you can think of the history of the world in many ways as the history of diseases. There's a really, uh, a really uh, cool history book from the 70s. It won major awards by a guy named William McNeil called Plagues and Peoples. And notice the name Plagues comes first in that title. Uh, and he makes the argument that in many ways, the history of the world is the history of diseases. Uh, that really, it, it, the history of the world is this battle. And again, I, I, I'm recording this in the middle of a COVID pandemic. Some of you are taking this online class because you don't want to be in a face-to-face -face class because of the COVID pandemic, right? Uh, so, so I think right now we're, we're having a pretty good sense of, oh yeah, diseases matter. But if you think about uh, the humans and diseases, so we get sick, um, if, we, if we don't die of it, we develop immunities for it. And then of course the virus will get stronger and then we get better immunities and the virus gets stronger then we get better immunities. So now as we get vaccinations, and, and again, it's this ongoing battle, right? It's sort of like today, if you turned on a computer from 1995, it's not gonna work. Not only, it's just the program so out of date, but it's also gonna have all these viruses. And so you can think of a human as, as like a computer. We gotta constantly update our programs. We gotta have better immunity. Sometimes we get those naturally. Sometimes we get those through medicine and vaccinations. So in Africa, this battle between humans and germs has been going on for literally over 100,000 years. For Europeans and Native Americans, they've been out of that loop for a long time, and especially Native Americans. They've been completely out of that loop, right? So it's Europeans are showing up in Western Africa and basically they have out of date programs. In other words, immunities, right? So they're much more prone to these diseases than even the local Africans. The local Africans are still getting sick, but nothing like Europeans. And then as Europeans and Africans come to the new world, bringing these old world diseases with them, they're meeting people who were even more out of date when it came to immunities. And of course, where do we get a lot of our diseases from? We get them from livestock. So when you get livestock, um, you, you develop uh, diseases, but then you develop immunity. So even though West Africa didn't have as many livestock, they do eventually get cattle and camel. Uh, but when they come to the new world, there is no livestock. So they're even worse off. So uh, diseases really did shake the world so much. So those are your two answers. Took me about 40 minutes to get there, but <laughs> West African empires and definitely diseases. All right, let's do a Let's do a tiny little history of Africa. I mean, I've spent the whole time just building up to this. Now we're going to do about five minutes of this. So just like with, with uh, pre-Columbian peoples and, and, and really peoples anywhere in the world, the, the early history is very similar. 
I go into a lot of detail with pre-Columbian peoples, but really for Europeans and Africans, it's almost exactly the same thing. People are nomadic, they settle down, they start developing pottery, they start developing various cultures, uh, they slowly develop agriculture, they develop chiefdoms, and then later become kingdoms, and maybe eventually modern nation states. Every culture tends to go through the same pattern. Uh, in Africa, Western Africa, it's happening a little bit earlier than it's happening, say, in Native America, because people were there longer. So 3,000 years ago, so we're talking 2000 BC and even earlier, we're already seeing what in pre-Columbian America, we weren't seeing until about 1500, you know, with the Mississippian peoples. We've got long distance trade going thousands of miles, even though we're only talking about Western Africa. Again, that is the size of the United States. So you're talking two, 3,000 mile trade routes, right? You got uh, pottery, you got lithics, which is uh, basically stone tools. You also have metal tools. And there's always kind of been this perception that metal tools are coming from Asia and Europe. But actually, they were using metal tools really early on in Africa. People do forget that. And they're already farming. And again, remember, with pre-Columbian lecture, we talked about all the changes that farming brings. It, it forces organization. It organizes religion. It creates labor divisions. It creates political organization. Um, so anywhere farming developed, you're going to see those kinds of changes. So we're already seeing that Western Africa. It's already happening in, you know, 3,000 years ago. Flash forwarding a little bit, about 100 AD thereabouts, we start to see Christianity showing up in Western Africa, which always surprised the students. I think there's always this perception uh, that, that, that these were completely pagans, which just means if you're pagan, it just simply means you're not Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. Um, and some were, without a doubt. So again, that's an old argument for slavery. And, and I still hear people say, that, well, they were just a bunch of savages running around with spears. They, were, they didn't even know about Jesus. We saved them. Uh, actually, Western Africa had Christians long before much of Europe had it. I mean, you talk, you know, the history of Scotland, for instance, or the history of Ireland or Norway. I mean, even as late as 1000 AD, you, you know, you still have Vikings that were not Christians yet, right? And didn't even know much about it. And that's interesting that Christianity, it doesn't, it does not become the dominant religion, but it is an ongoing religion. Many people brought over slaves were Christians by birth. Um, Christianity is really going to take off uh, in places like Ethiopia. Um, in fact, one of the earliest churches of the Christian faith is the Church of Ethiopia. It's still a major church today. Uh, and in fact, there's some really interesting histories of Christianity in Africa, and it's a lot, a lot more in-depth than people realize. So we see Christianity there. Uh, by 700 AD, we see Islam in Western Africa. And again, both of these, I mean, these are very soon after these religions sort of emerge, right? I mean, it was Christianity uh, as an organized religion. And even 100 AD, it was still not super organized yet. Um, but, you know, if, if the dates are correct, you know, 33 AD, Jesus is dead. By 100 AD, you already got Christ Jesus' followers in Western Africa. Again, Islam, same thing. It, it's, it's just starting as a faith, and yet already you have Muslims showing up in Western Africa. And this does become a much more dominant religion than even Christianity does. And that's a question. And in fact, if you look at your review sheet, one of the things I have on there is what is the role of religion in the creation of empires? And this is, in other words, this is important. There's a reason why Christianity is already showing up. There's a reason why Islam is already showing up. And there's a reason why, for instance, Judaism is not so much. I mean, actually, there are some Jewish peoples in Western Africa, but not many at all. Um, some religions, because all religions are not the same, obviously, some religions are missionizing religions. Islam and Christianity are, are really the two biggest examples of that. I mean, if you are a Christian, and we're in Southwest Georgia, I bet if I had to guess, probably most people in this class would identify as Jewish or Christian. But if you are a Christian, it is your moral duty to tell the whole world about your faith. Because if they don't know about your faith, if they don't get themselves saved, you believe that when they die, they will spend eternity in hell. It would be like if you saw a baby about to be burned to a crisp, you would stop that, right? 
well, isn't that all, you know, again, I'm not, I'm, this is definitely, you know, I, I'm not getting into my private beliefs, but, but just in, you know, from the viewpoint of Christianity, isn't that all of us, aren't we all about to burn for eternity if we're not saved? So isn't it our move? And that, and that is, I mean, I mean, that is, you, we are expected to go out and tell everybody about the faith, right? And, you know, I, 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 I just realized I need, I'm, I'm wasting, I'm getting long in time, so I'll, I'll, I'll back off. I usually go a little further, but I think I've done enough on that. So there's a reason why Christians are beginning to spread. Same with Islam. It's exactly the same thing. That it is, they are expected to do this. It's not the only reason, but it is one of the reasons why certain peoples move around the earth and some peoples don't. Some religions, they don't really care if you believe in their beliefs. That's not their goal. Native Americans in Georgia, you know, the Mississippian peoples like the Calusa or the Wali or the Appalachee, they didn't care if you believed in their gods. In fact, they'd probably prefer that they, you didn't believe in their gods because that means their gods would like them better. Uh, Judaism, which, which of course both Islamic Christianity emerge out of Judaism. Uh, Judaism itself is not really a missionizing religion. You might get the knock on the door. You might get somebody go, hi, uh, I'm, I'm Tom. I'm from the local Baptist church. You ever thought about what would happen if you die? Why don't you come to our church, right? But you never go, hi, my name is Ishmael. Uh, I'm from the local synagogue. Uh, you ever want to come to our, you know, it, it's, it's just not happening, right? So some religions are missionizing, some are not. And so again, because people always say, well, if, West, if Africans were so great, why didn't they colonize? Why do we colonize them? Or if Native Americans were so great, why weren't they the ones sailing around the world? Uh, and then that's a complex question, but one of those answers could be the religion. So anyway, enough of that. Uh, but, but I think that does kind of get into some of the, the how and why that we see world history take the path it does. Now, again, as I said, Islam really starts to really take root much more than Christianity does, in fact. And one of the aspects of Islam is, and I know today in a post 9-11 world, you start saying Islam and people get, you know, and, 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 and so I'm definitely not getting into the modern debates of a religion. But from a historical viewpoint, historians do like it when Muslims show up. And, and for one reason, part of being a good Muslim and this, the same thing applies to being a good Jew. Not necessarily for Christianity, although I would argue it should be, but, but not everybody would argue this. But for, but for Islam and for Judaism, you are expected to know how to read and write because you are expected to read, say, the Torah or the Quran. You're also expected to know, and this is maybe very different, uh, from some of the modern images, say, of Islam, uh, but you are expected to know about the world. The more you know about math, the more you, if you know, think algebra comes out of the Islamic world, for instance, the more you know about math, the more you know about science, uh, the more you're supposed to know about the will of God. Uh, while for some Christians, it's almost just the opposite. Uh, believe me, I, I, I've been teaching for a while. I know there's some things I talk about that people go, oh, I went to a religious school, so I wouldn't hear what you just said. You know, so um, even though science, lots of science have come out of Christianity, most of the major scientists of, of, of the Western world were Christians, but at the same time, it's not considered a, a, a core idea of it. So when Islam shows up, what does all that mean? Written records. And even though written records, this is my cheat sheet, even though written records isn't uh, the only way we get history, it's a nice way to get history, and it makes life so much easier. This is why suddenly we know quite a bit about Western Africa, because uh, as Islam comes in, uh, it becomes the religion of the elites of Western Africa, and suddenly you get a lot of writing, a lot of learning, you get books, you get documents, you get traditional history. That's why we like it. That's why we like it when, when they show up. Um, and so you start to get some of these early empires. You get the empire of Ghana, the empire of Mali, the empire of Songhai. Um, this is the Catalan map. This is a, a map from the 1300s. Uh, it's actually a, a, a very large map. Uh, this is a, a extreme close-up of it showing parts of Western Africa. Um, this was, a, again, a map from Spain, even though uh, people in Spain weren't even in 1300s really had very little knowledge of Africa and they definitely didn't know how big Africa was going to be but they were already getting word that in western what we now call western Africa that there were these pretty incredible kingdoms and in fact that person you saw on the previous map 
Oh, let me go back to it just for a second. Sorry. And you, you, it, again, this is a European image of what this person is supposed to look like. Um, so you got this very European crown and the scepter and in his hand, he's holding basically a hunk of gold. This is Mansa Musa. Mansa just basically means leader or emperor. So it's like King Musa is who this is. And the reign is 1312 to 1337. Um, he was notorious. Uh, everybody in Europe would have heard of Mansa. Everybody who was educated would have, would have heard of this guy, Mansa Musa. Uh, they may not know much about him, but they would have re recognized this person. Uh, we, we really don't know what the person looked like. Unfortunately, there's no artwork that survives of him. Uh, this is obviously a modern day drawing. What he might have looked like, we, we really don't know for sure. Uh, he was in charge of the Mali Empire, which already was a thriving empire. Very little of it is still in existence today. Uh, it was an Islamic empire of West Africans. Uh, Mansa Musa uh, was a big patron of the arts. He, he established a university in Timbuktu. Um, he, uh, at one point in, let's see, 1520, excuse me, 1524, I had to think for the date for a minute, in 1524, he went on a pilgrimage, you know, he went to Mecca, and at one point, and some accounts think, said he had tens of thousands of people with him. I'm just going to say thousands. I'm always a little skeptical of really high numbers, but but he definitely traveled with thousands and thousands of people. I am going to do a little cheat here, because I always get statistics a little bit wrong, as so I want to since I'm recording, I want to get a little bit right. Um, he had hundreds of camels, and each camel would have carried about 300 pounds of gold. He was sitting on the best uh, gold supply in the world. And apparently, when he went through Cairo and Egypt on his way to Mecca, you know, he stopped for a while with all these people. Everybody he met, they gave gold to. And apparently they gave so much gold out that the value of gold in Egypt declined for the next 12 years. Because again, there was so much gold, it wasn't worth as much. Um, and then when he went to Mecca and went throughout the Middle East, he brought back a lot of scholars and including a lot of architects with him. And in 1527, uh, again, it, it, this is only a fraction of what it originally looked like, uh, but using the local materials, which unfortunately was in a lot of stone in this part of Western Africa. So again, that's another thing to keep in mind. Even when we talk about Native Americans, they built these incredible mounds and structures, but they were made of earth and sand and they don't survive over hundreds of years. While uh, the Mayan ruins, it, or the you know incredible cathedrals of Europe because they're built of stone, they do indeed survive. So unfortunately, a lot of these buildings don't survive, but we do have some. And this is a mosque. Uh, I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to pronounce the name, but this is a mosque that uh, Musa had built by an Arab architect, and it's still in use. Uh, again, it's not the full mosque that it once was, but it's still in use today. Uh, the reason I have this particular map here is there has always been rumors that uh, Africans might have come to the New World. Uh, and some of you are going to roll your eyes and others may not. Uh, there's no reason why it couldn't have happened uh, because actually the distance between Western Africa and Brazil really, you, people forget how far over South America is. It really isn't that strong of a difference. Um, and actually a lot of West Africans were very good at shipbuilding. They did a lot of sailing. In fact, we know that the Mali Empire, people went around uh, the Cape, uh, you know, the, the Southern tip of Africa. Uh, and we know that Musa, for instance, uh, sent out a, a huge fleet uh, that went westward. Um, and, and, and they always talk about finding strange lands. They probably, there, was, there were several islands out there. That's more likely what they have. I will be very clear. I am not a believer. In case anybody's wondering, I do not believe Africans ever came to the New World. I believe they could have. I believe absolutely that technologically speaking, they could have. I think one of the main reasons they don't is there was no need to. As we're going to find out with Europe, there was a real need for them. Europe was having some real problems. That's why Europe starts colonizing. You don't just start colonizing out of the blue. We went to the moon. We're not there anymore because we don't need to be in the moon. Things get rough on Earth. Who knows? We might start colonizing the moon one day, but we're not doing it yet. And the same thing here. Molly was doing just fine. And I just, there is absolutely no evidence. And, I, and one of you I'm spending some time on this, it always comes up if I, if I don't talk about it. Um, there are some circumstantial evidence. There, you know, there's some statues in Central America by the Omex. We'll look at those later in another lecture. They do kind of look African a little bit. 
but they also look Asian too at times. Um, but, th but there is nothing in the New World that is of African origin that predates slavery and colonialism. It's just, it's a neat idea. I've seen Joe Rogan's podcast where people get on there and talk about it. It's a neat, it makes for neat speculation, but there's no, there's no real validity to it. But I do want to point out, it could have happened. I just don't think it did uh, technologically. And that's, we kind of forget. We don't think of Africa as being capable of doing something like that. Uh, it was Masa Musa might be somebody that some of you know, because Again, it gets really tricky when you try to compare what something cost even just a hundred years ago to today. When you start talking about centuries ago and you're talking about different types of money, it's almost impossible. But but looking at, say, the value of gold today and, and getting a sense of how much gold he had, there is a lot of speculation that Masa Musa very likely was, in, in a modern sense, the richest man who's ever lived. Uh, I mean, by almost any study, people just say it's just it's just it's unfathomable how much money this guy would have had in a modern world if 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 a person today had as much gold as this person actually had. And again, this is kind of a silly thing, uh, but it's still kind of interesting to try to go through and see well, how rich would a Caesar have been? How rich would Andrew Carnegie have been? You know, and Masa Musa. Uh, uh, blows them all out of the water. So we talk about Jeff Bezos today or Bill Gates nothing compared, even to John D. Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie, and then when you go back even further, uh, nothing to that. And real quick, I mean, there are several empires and, and even smaller kingdoms, like the, the kingdom of Benin, uh, which is, again, a relatively small little country, uh, excuse me, small little kingdom, um, but they were very long-lasting and, again, quite powerful and major trading partners. And again, you can see just how small they were compared to some of these other kingdoms. Uh, one reason I mentioned them is, is that they get mentioned a lot in his books because of the incredible bronze artwork that came out. I mean, it really, it, it rivals anything coming anywhere else in the world. And it's not something we associate uh, with Africa uh, as far as the incredible artwork. And again, it's not just, the, just amazing artwork, but the fact that it's made out of metal. And, and again, the techniques used here, uh, com comparatively to the similar artwork elsewhere, including Europe, it really blows them out of the water. And if you ever get a chance to go to the British Museum in London, uh, there is an incredible display of Benin uh, artwork there. And this is just a fraction of some of the artwork you see. And these are pretty large, by the way, and there's just hundreds of them. It's really quite amazing. Anyway, real quick, so uh, just a kind of a quick description of these empires. I mean, these are strong empires. I mean, Mali is the most famous one. It's the largest one. Um, as I have another map here uh, that shows some of the others. And again, you can see the Mali with Timbuktu and the capital of Gao, but you also see some of these others. There's also Songhai. There's also Ghana. Um, but these are very strong empires uh, with extensive trade. They have armies. And, and again, Mississippi people didn't have armies. They had warriors, but not these are organized armies. I mean, uh, uh, the, the capital was literally a walled city. Uh, I mean, these were not places that, that a few Europeans are just going to march into and go, let me take all your stuff and enslave all your people. Uh, that ain't happening, man. Uh, this, is, this is, again, this is one of the major reasons why Europeans do not colonize this. The other reason would, of course, be diseases. Uh, but we are talking about armies, uh, taxation, and the reason I say taxation, that might seem kind of random, uh, but to truly tax people, uh, it's kind of like farming. It, I mean, yes, there's, you know, taking a sword and saying, give me your stuff, but true taxation uh, where you're setting tax rates and you're actually collecting. I mean, that requires organization. That requires record keeping. Uh, again, you got to you got to assess the values. I mean, it, it's 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 a sim it's a, a symptom of an organized state in many ways. So that's why historians often point out when when a group taxing because it's it's kind of like agriculture. It, it's a level of organization. And again, these are primarily Muslim. Uh, peoples. But again, we're talking, the leadership is Muslim, but we still see Christianity here. We do see a little bit of Judaism, but we see a lot of indigenous. Indigenous just means the local beliefs. So it, it, it is a pretty multicultural area. Um, and again, it is primarily this area. And the reason I'm talking about it is because it's from this area that the vast majority of African Americans today, some African Americans come a little further south, and there's even on the other side of Africa, there is Madagascar, an island, and we do see some slaves coming from there. But the vast majority of African Americans, especially in North America, and when we get into slavery, we'll see that slaves 
uh, from Africa went, different slaves from different parts of Africa went to different parts of America, had to do with shipping routes. But most of North America, this is where African Americans would come from. So if you're African American, a uh, very good chance that your ancestors would have come from this part of the world. All right, uh, probably way too long for you guys, but there you go. You have a brief history of Africa. And so now, uh, next time you listen to a lecture, you should be hearing a bit about Europe. Alrighty, thank you guys. And uh, until next time, I'll talk to you guys later.